Thank you so much. Thanks. Hello, everyone. It feels very, very nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming. So today, I will try to answer the question I have been receiving for the last few years. And people keep asking, in this PhD thing of yours, what is it that you do exactly? Um, and I tell them it's well about image quality and it's about printing and then they make some kind of joke about me fixing their printer or their Skype accounts. Um, today I have a little more time to explain what I have been doing, uh, but I want to try to sum it up at the beginning. Um, for the last four to five years, I have been trying uh, to improve image quality in printing. Printing uh, has a certain workflow it follows, but in literature uh, there, fin there are uh, another ways in order to uh, improve that image quality, and these have not, these, there are still a lot of open questions with that. So uh, I have been trying to answer those questions, go beyond what printing can achieve, and trying to raise the understanding of what can be done and how it can be done. So let's start with the basics. You have a printed thesis in front of you. How did that flower get into that paper? So you have, if I have a flower on the screen, and if you have a flower printed, how did, what, what is the process that makes that possible? What are their conversions, uh, technologies, chemical reaction, light interaction, what is happening there? Moreover, if you take a look with a magnifying glass at the flower on the thesis, and if you take a look at under a magnifying glass on the picture on the screen, what difference would it be? What would you see in one and what would you see the other? In order to answer these questions, uh, I will address them in my introduction. I will talk about printing and multi-channel printing. Then I will tell you about my research topics, the topics I have been addressing for the last four to five years. First, there is multi-level half-toning. Second, there is a color separation that I've been working on. And third, there is a grainness characterization in order to improve the image quality. Then I will end with the conclusions, but let's start at the beginning. An image on the screen. How do we perceive the notion of colors here? Uh, well, the screens, monitors, displays, cameras, they emit light in order to display the image. Specifically, they emit three lights, a red light, a green, and a blue. When these red, green, and blue lights mix, they achieve the sensation of all the colors that you can see on these devices. So they need energy source in order to display these colors. Contrary to that, in printing, we don't have a light source that's being emitted. So we're not talking about RGB mixing. We're talking about actually the exact opposite. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, CMYK, are the, three, are the four um, inks that, when mixed together, achieve the sensation of hue. So when you place inks on top of each other, you just build the color on top of each other, and you end up with black. If you get full coverage of those four inks, you will get black. This is why this color space is also called a subtractive color space, whereas an the RGB color space, if you keep adding lo those lights, you get white, ergo a subtractive color, uh, an additive color space. Let me show you the CMYK mixing. So by mixing these inks together, you get 
the perceivable colors. But there are only four inks. So how, if you have only black, how do you achieve gray? If you have only four colors, how do you achieve the light versions of those colors? This is actually done by placing ink droplets on top of the paper. So placing inks, printing, it's actually a binary operation because you either at a certain position place ink or not place ink. So these ink droplets need to be, if you make them, uh, undistinguishable to the human eye from uh, the distance, you will just perceive them as a shade. If you place many of these dots or close together, um, or uh, then you will achieve a darker shade, then what would you get if you place them sparser apart? So this is how you achieve, achieve shades in printing. But the printers are not able to reproduce all the colors that we as human observers can see. So our human visual system is actually capable of, repro of uh, recognizing many more colors. So we need another color space in order to define this. We need a color space that doesn't depend on a device or on a technology such as RGB or CMYK. We need a more generic color space where we can really describe the true color, so to say. One example of such color space is one that I will use in this presentation quite a lot, and it's called the LAB color space. So in this color space, mapped here as a sphere, uh, there are three coordinates, lightness, A, and B. A and B are chroma channels, chroma dimensions. So each color in this color space will be assigned three coordinates that will describe the color. In my research, wherever, whenever I print, um, in order to verify the result, I use a device such as these uh, in order to measure the color. And I measure it, for instance, in this LAB color space in order to verify the result. So back to my original question, how do we go from the screen to the print? Well, we start by an image in LAB color space. And then we go into a separation to the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Uh, this separation, this CMYK, we also call channels. So we talk about a cyan channel, a magenta, yellow, black channels. And this process from going from LAB to CMYK in order to print, we call color separation. Now, here is what, where it gets very scientific -y because you need to understand the printer. Uh, the light interactions of the inks, the, uh, the light. So you need to really understand what's going on there in order to be able to get this separation from one space to the other. In addition, there are, uh, LAB has three dimensions, L, A, and B. Meanwhile, CMYK has four, CMYK. So it's th this will result that the CMYK, th there might be multiple CMYK combinations that give the same LAB value. It's not a unique one-to-one. -one. Um, however, this is not really an issue because literature has been dealing with this for quite a while, and this is a known transition. After we have CMYK, each channel gets half-toned, binarized, and then ink is applied wherever the binary ones are and printed. So, CMYK printing, the state of the art. Now, I want to go beyond that. 
In printing, it's possible to use additional inks in order to improve certain quality aspects. Uh, one thing that can be added are lightings, because uh, remember that the dots, you place dots of ink, so if, if they happen to be very contrast with the paper, or very large, or we stand really close, we might be able to see the dots, which decreases the visual pleasantness. So these light inks uh, we add in order to decrease this uh, unpleasant impression and to improve the image quality. More inks that we can add? Well, CMYK gives you certain colors, but why not go beyond that? Why not increase the scope of what printer can reproduce? And this is why we can add RGB inks. So in order to, again, further improve image quality. And printing with more than four channels, more than traditional CMYK channels, we call multi-channel printing. Challenges, the part where I come in. So I already said color separation goes from LAB to how many channels we need to print. But in multi-channel printing, we have more channels, right? So instead of going from one, uh, from LAB to four channels, we can go to quite a lot. Now, this is an open research question. How do we use these things in order to create the best image quality possible? And for that matter, what is the best image quality possible? How do we measure that? How do we quantify that? How do we evaluate that? These are all very interesting questions and uh, these have been the focus of my research. I would like to do a separation like this and I have been able to, in my thesis, go from LAB to multi-channel printing in order to achieve a good image quality. So, my first contribution, multi-level multi half-toning. So if we take a look at the color separation from an LAB color space into these channels, um, this is one of the reasons this is not straightforward, um, is that the in order to characterize this, in order to predict the result, we say, predict the printed result, we need to employ color models. Uh, with a rise in channels, uh, rises the complexity of using these models in time, in computational speed, um, in complexity. So, my thought was, well, why not, instead of having a separation to all these channels, why not leave the separation at it, as it is from LAB to CMYK, but then in each of those channels, instead of using only one ink, we use multiple inks. Let's take a look at the black here. So, instead of making the color separation more complicated, more complex, more expensive, uh, we employ a multi-level half-toning algorithm that deals with this part of the separation. So instead of the half-toning algorithm, instead of usually what it does, binarizes the image, I use it uh, to multi-level half-tone an image. So my image will have multiple levels and to each one uh, is assigned to each of the inks. Um, an example of how I did it is here in this ramp. So uh, this ramp is half-toned, multi-level half-toned to multiple levels and then each of the ink is used in one region. Now, spe the specifics about this are in my thesis, and I don't want to go into that. But I do want to say, well, and with, uh, yeah, with that, we also go um, from each cyan, magenta, yellow, and black channel, we go into multiple inks. Back to what I was saying, 
there are two challenges that I just want to briefly mention. And one is what about the thresholds between the inks? This is my first contribution here. So um, in order to, uh, there needs to be some kind of measurement going on because right now we have one channel, but that channel contains uh, information about ink placement of multiple inks. So this is not straightforward. So assigning where the inks transition, this was one of the contributions. Another is what we call dot gain. So in print, you have the halftone dots, right? But then, once you place them on the paper, what happens? The paper absorbs the ink, right? So it spreads. We're talking about an enlargement in dot size. Then, afterwards, there is light interacting with this print. So we, we see the print as even larger. To sum it up, there is a difference between what we have as a digital halftone and what we end up with the result. And then what's then? Um, each ink has a different dot gain because each ink will interact differently with light and with each other. So we're talking about multiple inks overlapping and creating different results. And speaking of results, um, here I have half-toned a ramp because the ramp is actually uh, one of the most uh, straightforward ways for the human observer to see if there are any discrepancies. So what you see here is a ramp that's being used with a multi-level half-toning with three inks, and enlarged are the areas of ink transitions. And uh, there are no discrepancies here, which is a good uh, sign. Here is a comparison between the bi-level half-toning, the usual one, uh, using only the black ink um, on the left, and on the right is our algorithm implemented uh, and used with multiple inks. You can see that in the latter case, the grayness has decreased. Another example is in a color image. So again, the left is the usual state of the art with one ink, the bi-level half-toning, and the, le the left is bi-level half-toning, and the right is with our approach. So, second contribution, the color separation. Now I have talked about a way in order to multi-level halftone one channel to multiple inks. But there is still the part where that I need to test whether this actually works in a color prediction situation in a color separation. So going from LAB to four channels, and these four channels will be used with multiple inks. Uh, let me tell you about the state of the art here. You have, there is an input color um, that represents one pixel in the previous image. So each of these pixels needs to pass through uh, a color model. So this pixel has these LAB values, which look like that. And then there have been many, actually, color models that try to uh, predict the output. So one in the 30s uh, was a relatively simple model, and the result it predicted was this. So you can see that the colors are not very similar. This is because uh, the full effect of dot gain has not been accounted for in this model. So here is a model that does have that uh, dot gain incorporated. And you can see that the result is much better. Then there is a model that extends this model by additional, we call them training samples. 
see all these models are um, physical models. So they, uh, you feed them with input information, with training samples, and then they predict the outcome. So the following model uh, works on a subcube division that just amplifies the number of training samples in order to get a better prediction. And so it does. Now, you can see that the colors are different and which colors represents better, but how do we measure that? Um, there is a color difference metric. Uh, this is one of the simplest equations. Uh, it basically takes Two, uh, two colors and their LIB values, L1, L2, A1, A2, and B1, B2, and does an Euclidic distance, uh, but weightened, actually. So if you incorporate that into the equation and compare these two colors, you will see that the color difference is around 28. So the larger it is, that indicates a larger difference between two colors. Then if you take a look at, at the result with the other color, you see that the color difference has lowered, and this is in accordance to what we see. And with the third one, you see that the color difference is around one. A color difference of around one is what we call a just noticeable difference. This is what we can define that a human observer cannot distinguish between two colors. Everything below one indicates a uh, very good color reproduction. Now, back to my color separation and the results of that. So again, we have a color separation going from LAB to four channels on which I use multiple inks, and I want to verify the correctness of this. I do it in, in with a histogram. So you see the color difference values. And you see that the large part of this histogram lays below a color difference of one, which is really good. The mean was around 0 0.9. And this is based on around 15,000 samples. So it's quite a lot. To verify it, we can also um, input an image LAB values, right, as the example of the flower. And this flower separated um, and half tone it with this approach, print it, and here are the results. So you see that the grainness is pretty good. And this is because we keep using those light inks. Without those light inks, the grainness is quite much larger. But in multi-channel printing, uh, we, sh we can use the lightings, but we can go beyond that, and we can use the RGB inks um, in order to achieve a better reproduction. So um, in order to maintain the complexity of the color models I was talking about, uh, we group them many times in groups of four. So now we have here many channels that we want to group in four. If we display them like this, the inks and the channels, we can identify the main subspace of these inks, CMYK, the usual one. And then by adding the inks, we can see the red subspace, the green, and the blue. Now the blue one is the interesting one because it has more inks than any of the others. So it makes it more complex in order to display the results. Or um, Also the blue ink here, it doesn't come with a light version of the blue ink. So uh, if we use it, what happens to the perceived image quality? So this is why uh, I focused on this subgamut. So in this part of my research, I go from LAB values into uh, these four channels. And now, 
it comes very interesting because we get to this part that's called colorimetric redundancy. And that is, given an LAB, uh, look how many inks we have here. So there will be a lot of ink combinations able to reproduce the same LAB, especially if we get a very dark color like this one I'm showing. So specifically for this LAB, there are over 8,000 ink combinations here that are able to reproduce it. In this image, each line is one ink combination. So how do we choose? What, how do I choose? What is the best ink combination? What is the best ink combination? I would like to know the image quality of each one. So how can I predict it? Let's take a look at this patch. These are um, two, actually two different ink combinations giving the same color. And let's take a look a bit closely. You see that the result is very different. You see that the quality is very different. And if I asked you today, you would probably all agree on which one is better for you. So we can say that the one on the left is very grainy. It's very noisy. Uh, and this has urged me uh, in the direction of my third research topic, which has been grainness characterization. Let me tell you first about the state of the art here, so what is generally known. So here are different patches of different colors. Uh, each column has the same coverage and each row has the same color. You see that the grainness impression, if you compare um, the black and the yellow, is very different. This means that the grainness is going to be dependent on the color of the ink you use it with. Another thing that will influence the perception of grainness is actually how our human system human visual system works. Um, our human visual system is dependent on the frequency of what we see. So in order to mimic uh, what is there on the print, we need to apply special filterings that mimic the human visual system. Here is one that mimics what the human observer would see at 10 centimeter distance and at 40. This filtering, it's called uh, spatial filtering or S-Lab. We add a spatial dimension into the LAB values. And this is exactly how it goes. So for a given patch, it gets scanned and the spatial filtering is applied. Then that patch, uh, its LAB is calculated. And we can talk about a grainness index metric because we would like to assign one specific number. We would like to pull uh, the grainness impression into one number. So the grainness index metric uh, known in literature uh, takes the mean value of the LAB and compares it, compares the mean color difference to each of the pixels in the spatial filtered patch. So let's see how, what the results of the grayness metric says. For a black patch, black patches, on increasing coverages, the grayness looks like this. So at the beginning it rises, uh, as the black ink rises, and then it goes down. If we take a look at the blue patches, it's, well, blue has a bit less grainness. So you see here that the grainness index is also lower, and then yellow is even lower. Now this is the state of the art, and in order for me to calculate the grainness of each of these patches, there are hundreds of each color. So I have been printing and scanning and calculating the C-Lab for each of the hundreds for each color. But 
then remember this and my 8,000 in combinations. I would like to find a much better way in order to predict the grainness, uh, characterize it, understand it, understand its behavior. So this is something new in literature. This is something that I have been developing. I would like to expand the knowledge of the grainness behavior and do a, a, a kind of a prediction of the grainness of ink combinations. Uh, in order to do so, I have been constructing a data set based on 15,000 patches. This is one example of how they look like. And again, we are talking about this subspace with the blue ink. So let's see the results, because now for each LAB, I can only not only perform a color separation, but I can also include the grainness index of each one. So I know the quality, the perceived image quality of each one. So this is a fairly um, light LAB values, um, light color. So the number of ink combinations that can reproduce this color uh, is around 20. There are not too many. But you see that the grainness index is very different between them. At the beginning, around 10% blue coverage. Uh, the grainness index is around 0 0.8, pretty high. But then the grainness index uh, falls, and sometimes it's very low, low. Let's see for this other example. This is a slightly um, darker ink, so there are around 100 plus in combinations. And you see again that the greenness index is very different between them. So we have at the beginning, and this is uh, this color and this ink combination. Uh, for once on the left, there is uh, a grainness index of around 0 0.8, and on the right is around 0 0.5. The impression is very different. And then, in order to, be, to reproduce these colors, on the left there is 25% blue, and on the right, 125% summed coverage, total ink coverage. So, the, this is actually a very interesting question, because uh, which uh, choice should we pick? Which one is better? Uh, does the fall in grainness come with, uh, in this case, four times the ink consumption? So, this is not very economic in this case. So, what is better and how should we choose? Um, so, I have dealt with this issue uh, with a proposed color separation approach. I would see, like to have a color separation that um, has a very accurate colorimetric match to what I want, but I would like one that uh, also minimizes the grainness, but not at the expense of ink consumption. In order to do so, I have developed a cost function. Uh, the first metric I use is the color difference. And this is my function that minimizes it. Uh, so here, I have the variable that's called J and, day, J, J and D, just noticeable difference. If you remember, I was talking about a color difference below one and how humans are unable to perceive it. So what if we assign no cost at all the ink combinations whose color difference is below that one, the just noticeable difference? And then we can also include a weighting factor to whatever cost uh, that function has. Also, I want to include the grainness in order to improve the image quality. So just as the same with the color difference, I have defined a just noticeable grainness index. 
So this would be a user-defined uh, threshold below which I cannot, dis I cannot perceive a grainness. And again, all the color combinations whose grainness index is below the GNGI, I assign no cost. However, how much that cost might be, I multiply it by a weighting factor. These are my two functions. And in order to uh, choose the in combination, I sum them up. But again, the question about in consumption and the economic. So among those, I choose the one with the smallest ink consumption. Here are the results. On the right column, it's the result of my proposed cost function. And the smallest color difference refers to the usual color model that just takes into account the best color metric match, the best color uh, with the smallest color difference. First, there are the results of the color difference. You see that the maximum color difference has increased, but very slightly. And you see that the 98th percentile of the samples are around one in both cases. And remember, one meant that it was indistinguishable by human eye. So this is good. And now take, let's take a look at the 98th percentile of the grainness. So with the usual model is around 0 0.7, which is quite high. Uh, when we map that to our perception of grainness, I have been able to see that 0 0.7 means high grainness. So with our color model, that decreases to around 0 0.5. Why 0 0.5? Because this was what I have assigned as the just noticeable GI. So this means that 98% uh, of the results appear not grainy. And this is based on uh, the measurement, the calculations of this are based on 15,000 samples. And then the color consumption, you see that I have managed to not increase it. This is because my proposed method includes the ink consumption. So let's take a look at the the first model, the state of the art, the closest colorimetric match. For these samples, uh, for these four patches. And this is res the result with my proposed approach. We can also take a look at the numbers. You see that the GI of the first approach uh, is higher than the second one. Now, let's take a look at the ramp. So the top one is, again, the best color metric match, and the second is the result of my proposed approach. And you can see that the grayness is decreased. However, there is still some future work to be done, because sometimes with my approach, um, there occur some discrepancies when the inks shift in the color separation. So this would be part of future work. Now, here in these results, I have been focusing on just the blue subgamut, if you remember. But what happens when we include the, the red subgamut, another subspace? So how do we, does this shift induce this, uh, discrepancies? We have just quickly tested this, so we have not uh, done a full investigation into this. But for this specific example that we tried, there were no discrepancies. On the left is the result with the best color metric match, and on the right is the result with our proposed model, which includes a decrease in grainness. So, in conclusions, for the first time in literature, I have been dealing with a separation from LEB to all these inks, 
Why? Because I want to uh, improve the image quality. Uh, color separation techniques are rise in complexity, time. So by using a multi-level halftoning algorithm, we uh, lower uh, the, this complexity. And this is why uh, in literature, this is the first time that this approach has been used. Using the RGB inks, which is usually done in the color separation models in literature, uh, comes with a whole cost of high grainness sometimes. Uh, the red, green, and blue inks, especially the blue one, is very high contrast against the surface, the paper surface. The black is also. So um, that's why printers have also the light colorants. But because of the comp computational expensiveness, it's not very often used in literature. So uh, my approach includes them because uh, we are able to include the multi-level halftoning algorithm that we use. Also, we have tackled quite a lot in the investigation about grainness. Uh, so red RGB inks are great to use because they expand the scope of printable colors, but should we? Uh, when? Um, I constructed a very large data set in order to increase the understanding of this topic. And I have proposed a cost function that includes uh, a grainness uh, approach into the method. Thank you for your attention. I would like to uh, give you some samples of the things that I've been talking about because the projector has a completely different color conversion than what I've been dealing with. Uh, so I will uh, feel free to take a look if you're interested. Thanks. I think you have them already, so I pass it in. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Is it okay if you have a mic? I should probably just get one. Uh, you have this one, if that's okay. When you're ready, you shift the mute. Okay. I would like to thank very much for getting the invitation to come here to be opponent. It's, it's a pleasure. And, or first of all, you have done a lot of printing, just looking at 15,000 patches and, and measuring. That's a lot of work. I assume you have been spending a lot of time in the lab. <laughs> um, let's see. I actually have, you can find it. Yep. I actually made a presentation with some of the questions and things to, to go Should through. Should I open this one? Yeah. Perfect. So, um, I will start going through a little bit from my perspective after reading the thesis. Then I will go into some more general questions for the whole thing, and then we go very specific at the end, because I do have some very specific questions uh, that you didn't cover in your talk. Mm. Um, of course, the presentation that you gave was quite good. Uh, they answered some of the questions already. Okay. Um, so that's a good thing. Of course, publications are important, mm. um, and you have done quite many publications. Um, you have six main publications in your thesis, three conference, two journal publications. You also have your licentiate thesis, and you're the first author in five of these uh, publications, and you're the second author in the last. Um, and looking at the publications you have done, the conferences and journals, the places where it's published, they are very relevant. They're in conferences where you would expect to see these type of um, papers. 
to be critical, I could say that the journals that you have published, they have quite a low impact. Um, but of course, they are relevant and they are um, places where you would expect to see these papers. You also have five other publications, so in total there's 11 publications during your, your PhD, which is, I would say, quite many. The thesis, as we all have seen, it's a monograph. It contains eight chapters, 190 pages where 167 are numbered. Um, and it is of an expected structure and format. It's actually a very nicely uh, made thesis in, in terms of the writing and the presentation also. As for your presentation today, which was visually very pleasant, <laughs> you're talking about in your thesis kind of visual pleasantness, and also the presentation today was pleasant. It's good to be consistent. Absolutely. <laughs> which is also one of the things that's important when you do printing, to be consistent, mm. because you don't want to be... Uh, to get discrepancies uh, as you put them. <laughs> so the overview of the thesis, you have an introduction, you have a background where you cover color theory and reproduction and half toning. And then your contributions, the way I see it, comes in chapters four, five, or four to seven, more or less, where you talk about half tone quality evaluation, multiple half toning, and the color separation before you conclude. So putting this in perspective. Um, Multi-channel printing is a very active research topic. you have shown this by there are several groups who has actually been doing work in this area. Mm. Um, of course it's here with you and the group of uh, Sasan and Daniel. We have the group that I come from in Jövik has been doing these type of things. You have the group in Darmstadt um, who has also been doing uh, similar things. Um, they do the same thing in Switzerland at EPFL. So there is a very active community who has an interest in this. What you didn't mention in your presentation is that you were part of the CP7 project. So just showing that the EU is financing a project on multi-channel printing shows that it is an area where they would like to see more research. Mm -hmm. And they see this as one of the directions where the printing industry could go. And I don't think that they would fund a project that you're a part of if they do not believe that this was something in the future. And of course, the goal of that project was to educate and train early stage researchers. I think that that's what you have been doing for the last years. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the goal is also that when this was financed from the EU, that the, when the training has been completed, that these people should go and take a leading role out there in the industry when they're finished, or in academia. So of course, we can all see where this is heading for you, Paula. You should take a leading role in the future of multi-channel printing. I'm taking notes. <laughs> Um, and there's also quite a lot of interest from the companies in this. There's quite many research articles and patents. Uh, I took a look at the patents that's been coming and there's quite many. So you have HP, you have Xerox, you have OSA, Canon, Kodak and so on. They all have patents in this mm. area. Mm. Um, and they are paying attention mm. to what's happening. And you probably also noticed when you went to conferences, they do sit there and they do listen to what yeah. is being presented. And when I was looking at this, it seems like the activity in this area started from around 1990, and then it's been kind of up until today. And if you look from around 2010, there was like a bump. There was quite many more papers coming out in that area around uh, 2010. Um, which is kind of at the same time when this, uh, I'm not going to say your work, but the plan and thinking of the CP7 project. Mm -hmm. So that was my kind of just a reflection on the topic and the importance of the topic. So the goal of your research, as written in your, your thesis, is... The goal of the research presented in this dissertation is developing or adapting color separation models and half-toning algorithms that increase the perceived image quality multi-channel printing. 
And you have some focus areas and limitations, which of course is important because you can't cover everything. No. So you're focusing on multi-channel inkjet printing, and you have a specific focus on graininess and color accuracy, which is important to, to keep in mind. So you have summarized now in 45 minutes. I will summarize in one slide, because I, or I don't need to spend 45 minutes summarizing what you already said, but I wanted to take it from my view as an opponent, um, what is the summary? And it is improving the quality of color prints through the use of additional links. And this is more than CMYK. I think that the contributions that you have is in the area of doing quality evaluation of halftones, which is more this assessment of the quality metrics. Um, it is in the multi-level halftoning, where you look at finding suitable ink thresholds, dot gain compensation, and evaluation of the, the multi-level halftoning technique. You have done contributions in the print characterization, which is mostly on the evaluation of the accuracy, and in the color separation analysis of the color metric redundancy, the cost function that you presented at the end for color mm -hmm. separation, together with the evaluation that you have done of that cost function. And there is one statement that you have made in your thesis, which is predicting and considering graininess improves image quality. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important statement through the whole of your thesis. Mm -hmm. And it's written very clearly at one, pa one place that this is really what you have found, that you need to predict and you need to consider graininess in order to get an improved quality. Exactly. Reading the thesis, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's uh, well written, it's easy to read. Uh, you could kind of go on and go on and, and just read. Um, so it was very pleasant. Thank you so much. Uh, and it has a very good flow with the chapters very well connected, which is also what you expect from a monograph that it, you should mm -hmm. be able to do that. And I think um, being able to easily read and follow is important in, in a document. The experiment seems to be quite well designed and it seems to be well carried out. Um, the thesis is a contribution to the research field, which is also shown through the publications that you have done. And in my view, the last chapter is the best. Uh, that's where I think that uh, you show that you have excelled through your, your, um, your PhD, that you're able to take it to a new level that has a higher quality in, in the work that's been done. Of course, uh, I also need to look at the weaknesses. That's also a part of my role. Um, what I think is you could have been able to structure a little bit better to see exactly what is your contribution. Mm -hmm. To say, okay, this is my contribution. This is what I have given. Um, it's there, but you need to look a little bit closer to find it. There is some discussion that I feel is missing in part of the thesis where you could have spent a little bit more text and time to discuss the results that you have and the decisions that you make. Mm. There is also some of the existing work that I think or that you should or could have included. But of course, there's a lot of literature and you can't mm. go through all of it. And there are s some places where you're missing some of the details. So if I wanted to reproduce your work, I might not be able to do exactly what you have done because the details are not there. Okay. So if we start with some of the general questions, so I will stop talking and you will start talking instead. So in a few sentences, what is your work? You spent 45 minutes explaining what your work was about. If I give you two sentences to explain. I want to raise an understanding about what print quality is. And furthermore, I want to develop um, a better color reproduction model that can be used if one aims to improve image quality in terms of grainness. 
so yeah yeah uh, that that's a good okay good pitch mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and of course you're talking a lot about quality mm. and um, and you're the expert oh thank you oh thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> of course the image quality is, is difficult it's it's a big field there's a lot of mm. things happening and uh, of course, I've been so lucky that I've been able to do research in this field. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm an expert or not, that's... Uh, uh, well, I do think that looking at what you have done, graininess is the core. And graininess mm -hmm. is linked to quality. Mm -hmm. And there's, But there is also a lot of other things that you could talk about when we, we look at perceived quality. I'll get back to, to some yeah. of those things. If you were to pick one main contribution. You talked about several different contributions. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is the most important? I, well, you mentioned you liked the last chapter best, and I actually do the same. Uh, and I would say the best contribution, the, the one I like best, and the biggest one, I think it's in that chapter. I would say it's the proposed color separation approach mm -hmm. that, well, many steps are needed for this, but the end result and the contribution of making this proposed cost function is, mm, I would say, my main contribution here. Maybe I should have waited with saying the last chapter was the best till after I okay. <laughs> had this question, but still. I um, would say so either way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that uh, the... Um, the last chapter, as I said, I think it's the one that's the um, has the best quality in mm -hmm. the work that's being being done. So, you have done all of this now. You also have a small part on the future work. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention that in the presentation specifically, but what do you consider to be the main future work after? Uh, greatness understanding. Right now, I do my grainness prediction on based on a large data set. And I have been doing some work about, which I didn't mention in the presentation, but I did in the thesis, about um, m measuring grainness based on a smaller data set. Uh, and I didn't include all the results in the thesis either, uh, because I think this is still an area that can be improved. Uh, Furthermore, in the color separation, I talk about, well, using all these inks, but I didn't apply them to images, because here are also uh, things that can be improved. You've seen the discrepancies sometimes occur. So I would like to do much more work with that. So then I'm going to follow up with perhaps something that's a little bit more specific, because this going from patches and ramps to images, yeah. na or natural images. That's an interesting transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you go to images, mm -hmm. you get more problems, but you mm -hmm. also get some things that would make it easier. Because the content, mm -hmm. it will be content dependent how we perceive. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and of course, you could use this information or this um, characteristic as help. Mm -hmm. Um, because we do know that the information is being masked, uh, that you will not, or in an image with a lot of texture, you will not see that it's grainy. Yeah. Um, but in patches, you will yeah. see it. So, of yeah. course, there is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very interesting direction to look mm -hmm. into how mm -hmm. you can apply this to natural images. Definitely. A question that is very often asked in this type of, uh, kind of from the opponent is, if you could go back mm. and redo or change something, what would that be? I would definitely start with the <laughs> grayness sooner. Um, there is so much work there. And I really like the whole investigation about what image quality is, what print quality is. And actually, chapter four uh, is not published anywhere. And I mean, with a couple of more months, uh, you always lack those couple of more months, but uh, I feel like you have like, really understood grayness much more on a deeper level. So I would have really liked to do that in order to do more of the quality. 
Or I'm glad yeah. to hear that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, y or you say that with a couple of more months, you have your entire life in front of you. So, yeah. of course, you can do a lot in, <laughs> in the rest of your career. So there will always be time and uh, there might also be someone else who can pick up and continue. Mm. Yeah. And that's also one that of the questions nice. that I have because you clearly have a lot of data. Mm. What happens to this data and the knowledge that you have now that you're finishing? Uh, it must be passed on. I mean, definitely. I've been at this conference a couple of months ago at the EI, and I've been asked by Jose already to if they could use this data and mm. develop their research because they're also doing something like that. And someone in Vienna also. So, I mean... Whoever wants it can have it, and if they just fill me in, and <laughs> oh, that's very good. It's uh, um, it's very good that people are interested in the research that you do, yeah. and that they would like to to yeah. use it. And I would love also if my supervisors wanted to continue with this line of research, and they already have most of my codes, and they will have everything. So, yeah, I will encourage them to yeah. to continue. <laughs> Um, even if it's a monograph, if you were to pick one, one of the papers and say, this is the most important, which one would that be? Uh, the last journal one, the color research and applications one. And um, why is that? Why do you think that's the most important paper? Because that was my first big journal. I mean... Um, every most of the research researchers that uh, work in this field they publish there. So I have been seeing a lot of publications that are in that journal, and that was my I don't know golden. Uh, I wanted to get there. Um, so having a paper that's uh, that's good enough. I felt that the research was good enough, but you never know on your mm. own, especially if you're a PhD, so you don't have that much experience, maybe. Um, so when my supervisor said it was good enough for that one, and when I got the acceptance there, um, so that was very nice. It has then been reviewed by experts. Yeah, of course, of course. that it has the sign a significant contribution and high enough quality to mm. be accepted. Um, and of course, that is also some of the problems for me as an opponent, since all of the work that you have done has already been scrutinized by others. <laughs> so what I can do is just scrutinize more and come up I with more I have questions. had very good reviewers actually scrutinize quite a yeah. lot. <laughs> <laughs> reviewers are important. Yeah. We might not always agree with them, and you might <laughs> not always agree with me either, but um, it is part of, uh, of this yeah. field. I wanted to know, during this period of the PhD, how your view has changed of the research topic. Um, well, at the beginning, it was very confusing. I knew the technology. I did some work in image segmentation. I just didn't know how the two merged. So I didn't really understand what the color models were and what's all this with physical reactions on the ink or light. So at the beginning, it was very abstract. Uh, when I started really producing the results and doing measurements, and I did uh, most of the codes from scratch and the, co the modeling and uh, the C lab, uh, I tried to replicate what others have done in order to understand it. So. Uh, being able to reproduce it and have the results that changed enormously in my mind. I'm very glad to hear that you have been trying to do things from scratch and being able to reproduce because that adds a lot of value to seeing that, okay, how difficult it is actually to reproduce the work of other people, yeah. especially if they leave out details. Y yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can email me. <laughs> no, but it, it's... Um, um, this is an important uh, part of it. Yeah. And of course, you cannot put everything. You, you would have like a 500-page thesis. 
and that would take too much time. So you need mm -hmm. to make a, uh, make a decision at some point. So I told a little bit about what I think is strong and, and weak parts. What do you think are the strongest and the weakest part of your thesis? Um. I told you what I liked. I like the whole area with the proposed cost function. In order to do that, I had to dive into grainness. Um, I think there is still work to be done there. I don't know if that qualifies, it can both qualify strong and weak. Um, but maybe that's the answer I want to stick with because I, uh, in literature, it's not used a color separation to all these inks, and using them uh, has really, I think, an increased an, an understanding of what multi-channel printing can achieve and what's the result. So we have the RGB inks, but should we use them always, or when, or how? Uh, so I think those are really excellent questions, and I think those are very strong points. Um, and I've been trying to work a lot in answering those, but I think it's also a weak spot where I, I still can do more. There's still uh, work to do there. I think that uh, a lot of it's excellent questions that you're kind of um, bringing forward and I also believe that it's quite application dependent. Mm. Mm. Um, because mm. if you look at some applications, you wouldn't care too much about ink consumption. Mm. You would care about getting the lowest possible grainness and having the highest color accuracy, and you can use as much ink as you like. Right. Um, art reproduction being one of the areas where you would normally don't care too much about the cost as long as you're able to make something that is as close True. as possible. True. If you were to say one thing that would have improved your work during this period, that, that could be anything. Mm. I... Oh. Uh, we had quite a lot collaboration with many different institutes and I've been so lucky for that. I've been, like you said, in employed in the European research project. So I have been collaborating with a lot of people, but most of this collaboration was done in the, at the beginning. Then after a while, uh, people understood that geographical distance meant that it was harder mm. to really collaborate on papers, and many people did. But I would have liked to uh, to use the time when we were uh, together to know more about the research, to ask questions, to see what their workflows do. So I would, I think that would have been an improvement. So more collaboration would have. Yeah, improved. not necessarily in terms of research paper, just mm. like talking more. And I came and spent a couple of weeks in Jovic. I think that was enormously useful. Uh, so things like that. And then, what are you most proud of? Um, I am proud that I have been able to uh, leave the area where uh, sometimes people, uh, okay, what do you do printing? Okay, you mean like 3D printing? Oh no, like 2D. Okay, like can you fix my printer? So I'm, I like that I have been able to generalize that area into a more specific terms of print quality, of image quality, of modeling. So, um, uh, it's not specifically my contribution, something I did. It was kind of also given in the research group. Mm. Uh, but I I've, I've very much like that. I had one question about originality and novelty, but I think you already covered that, so okay. we don't really need to.
but maybe this question kind of, where did you go wrong? If you went, maybe you didn't go wrong. Maybe everything was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but Never is in research, <laughs> no. <laughs> but there, is there a place where you say, okay, this was actually wrong, I had to go back? Uh, many times, I guess. I mean, you try something and you kind of hope it will work, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, many times in the codes, many times in the color prediction and separation, and there have been endless brainstorming sessions, and the results didn't work, so why? What's wrong with the code? Uh, I don't know if I can enumerate something specific, no. but... But that's okay. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> it's or it clearly didn't go wrong in the end, looking at your thesis. So. I hope so. Um, if you look at your contribution and the relevance that they have to other researchers. Um, well, to other researchers, I would say the separation into all these different things. So uh, usually what literature does is increases print quality by introducing the RGB inks and then performing a color separation, looking at different illuminants, looking at even grayness, but not really, under, or not really describing and characterizing it. So by using the light inks and being able to include them with multi-level half-toning, that has been mm. a big difference with the literature because I have been doing, I have been able to do many other things. I think you already answered the industry saying that uh, OSE is already, or Canon is already kind of eager to, and that yeah, clearly I shows think the relevance. I think they base a lot of their color separation models on uh, visual testing mm. and subjective uh, measurements. That is my feeling. Or whatever they're doing, they're not always patenting it. Patenting it. No, they're not always telling what they're doing. Mm. That's one of the problems with the industry as well. Yeah. It's difficult to, to know exactly what, what they are doing. Yeah, but exactly. of course, you can look at some of the things that they have been publishing, especially with uh, Osea, because or if you look at the work that I did with them, mm -hmm. it has been published where yeah. they're trying to go yeah. towards metrics, yeah. going away from the subjective uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Of course, I kind of the research project that you have, where and the questions. Of course, I know it comes from CP7. I know the your things like this, but I don't think that this, this title specifically was in the application, <laughs> and I don't think that this was specifically what was mentioned in the, the description when you applied for a job. So how, how did it come from you, or how did you actually come up with these questions? Well, at the beginning, my supervisors were a huge help with that because they knew the, well, they know the topic very well. So they really guided me through the beginnings, the multi-level half-toning. Well, the guidance is throughout, but at the beginning, the multi-level half-toning, that was like really, this was a code that uh, Sasan already had and that was still an open question, how to implement that. So he suggested, why don't you do it like that? And then there was a lot of brainstorming there and a lot of help there. Then later, uh, just gradually, I mean, I tried different things and I would get their inputs and whether this makes sense or not. Uh, and uh, grayness was something I came with while looking, while actually me um, measuring a lot of printed samples. I saw that their color redundancy is huge, so I was actually pretty certain that it's a, it's possible to reduce the grayness. Um, and I wanted to test it, and that's how it go went. So grayness is <laughs> your. <laughs> What you say, your baby? Yeah, <laughs> in, I, I would say sense. so. Yeah. <laughs> so, what have you learned from this whole process of doing the PhD? It doesn't need to be scientific okay. things. It could also be others. I've learned um, that. Well, um, that it's very nice to be in academia. 
uh, that there is a lot of support and it's very nice to publish and to go to conference and to have people have read your work. Um, I also learned that it's very difficult to get to the final point of the PhD because it's ups and downs and it's perseverance. Um, and then I learned enormously about the research field and the state of the art and a lot. I will skip the next question because we don't need to go through each of the publications. Okay. Uh, and it's also this case that it's been mostly you and your supervisors. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite yeah. clear. Some of the additional publications where you have been working with other people, mm -hmm. uh, there might be a question about who has done what. Mm -hmm. um, and you already answered this. <laughs> Part that's not published. No. That was chapter four. Yeah. So it's, it's very. Then we can go to. Um, to a little bit more specific mm. um, questions. Uh, we already talked a little bit about CP7, the color printing 7.0, mm. next generation multi-channel printing. I always have this kind of section 1.2, page three, if people wanted to, to look at. Um, in context of CP7, where, where are you placed? Are you in the center or are you in the periphery? Um. CP7 was about multi-channel printing and all the different aspects that come with it. Uh, so it's a whole workflow going from LAB to the print with all these. And people have looked at spectral printing and art printing and two and a half D. I wouldn't say I was at the beginning because I would say that these are all ramifications. Mm. But if you were to put it in a workflow, I would think most be at the beginning with the color separation, but then at a lot of different places as well. And also all the way at the end because the, yeah. the graininess is yeah, an exactly. effect of what exactly. comes out. Um, the relation that you had to the other early stage researchers. Mm. You mentioned that you were in Jovic. Uh, I know you worked with the other one. Yeah. Um, but I know uh, how was your relation to the other? There were five, no, how seven? many? Seven PhD students and two postdocs. postdocs. So there's nine people yeah. or eight other people you could. And then the supervisors. Yeah. And well, I made them incredible connections. And many of these people are really dear to me. Um, I, it was an enjoyment to just go to these events and meet them and know that, I mean, at the beginning, everything is so overwhelming in the PhD, so it felt really good to, to share experiences and know from someone other in plain English what it is that they're doing. And then you understand a little more about this literature you've been reading and that seems so complicated. Um, so this has helped quite a lot. And uh, I've been to all these different <coughs> institutes and uh, universities, and I've seen many, many different companies and universities and their way of work and all the contacts and connections. So that has been amazing. Yeah, or I don't see that you have publications with the other CP7 mm. uh, people, but I know you referenced the work of Radovan in your thesis. I have one with Lude and Radovan. Yes, oh, that's true. And Yoninga. Yeah, from the additional publications, yeah, not exactly. the ones. Um, so we don't need to, to go into that. What was the main benefit of being in this project? Of course, you could have done this without being part of CP7. Um, just the connections, I think. I mean, when you go to conferences and you have a whole, whole group of people that is very well mm. emerged there, so they, they connect you to everyone. Uh, and they've been so kind to do so. I mean, and that's amazing because you can talk about everything. And people, I have asked people about their work and that has been really nice. We already covered this uh, question. Um, the second months, because you were, uh, oh. or the CP7 project had second months where the PhD students were yeah. supposed to go to another location and spend some mm. time. So you were a little bit of time in Jövik, but did you also have other 
I went to Johansvik uh, okay. in Midden Sweden University. Yep. I spent there a couple of weeks, but it was uh, they had research about uh, paper light interactions, uh, and this resulted in uh, courses, in PhD courses. Uh, a bit of research, but uh, nothing published. Mm. Yeah, and of course, and I, then I of know course to Yavik. Yes. Yep. Uh, okay, so looking at already in the abstract, you you state that the results show that the reproduction is visually improved in terms of grain mm. and detail enhancement. Mm. Mm. Yet I don't see any discussion in your thesis on mm. detail enhancement but you highlight it as the underlining is mine. That's not in the thesis, just to be clear. <laughs> um, uh, you do introduce perceived image sharpness, mm -hmm. um, but the methods that you introduce there, they are not included in the work, or it's not written here. Mm -hmm. You might have done things there. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate a little bit on this, why you decided to write this in the abstract? Yeah, I think this was, um how do you say? Um, a f um, this I um, I took from one of the uh, papers I wrote. So uh, since I wrote a monography, uh, my papers were well published, but then also adapted to the later thesis. Mm. And in the paper with multilevel half toning, I talk about detail enhancement. Uh, but I don't measure it. So this is why I haven't included in the printed mm. thesis. But I guess in the abstract, the thought remained. Uh, I would say that this is something that would need to cor be corroborated in order to make this statement. Uh, but I have based that on the notion that the uh, printed images using the multi-level half-toning algorithm in comparison to the bi-level half-toning, uh, so just using the four uh, multiple links instead of just the CMYK, um, the level of uh, detail uh, I was able to perceive is higher. But again, I didn't call up, I didn't measure this. Yeah. yeah. And of course, y you already stated this in, in your presentation as well, this yeah. um, this distance and what it actually has to say on the influence of, of image quality. So when viewed from a certain distance, the halftone image is ideally analog to the continuous tone input image. And the metric that you've used, you call it S-Lab or, yeah, or Spatial C-Lab, C -lab, yep. and it co incorporates information about the viewing distance. Um, so there are, uh, as I said, I've been working in this field, so there, there are other, perhaps more yeah. precise methods yeah. Yeah. Uh, that could be used. So why did you choose this as C-Lab and not more advanced methods? Uh, there was a paper by Farrell uh, in the 96 that, inc that started looking at C-Lab in, uh, in uh, concordance to half-toning algorithms. And they were the first ones to apply this. And they specifically say that this would be for textures or like mimicking the pattern. Uh, and then just looking at the literature and uh, there were some people, there were few people looking at grayness and uh, C-Lab was consistently there. So that's why yeah. I also used it. Yeah, I can come up with a lot of different arguments <laughs> why a C-Lab should be used I'm because sure it's probably can. been the most evaluated metric yeah. out there. But it's also shown to have some flaws. But um, I would say that the choice of a C-Lab, it is okay, it is good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it would also be nice to see some of the other more precise mm. metrics. Mm. Um, and you're using this iterative half-toning method that yeah. was developed uh, by the group here. Yep, exactly. Um, and you state that since it's been developed in the group, we have full control over the algorithm, and therefore this method has been chosen. Um, so it just seems like because you had it, you used it. We had access to other ones, but 
it's an iterative algorithm. So uh, the the output is many times better than uh, just regular error diffusion or some other type. Uh, so we didn't have access to DBS, for instance. Uh, and uh, IMCDP works very well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there are a few reasons, as I guess, I can yeah. elaborate not only because of yes, we had it. Just the way it's written in the thing. That, okay, it caught your eye. Because we yeah. had full control and that's why we selected. Yep. Uh, of course, I understand from reading the other part of the thesis that it's not only because it was available. Right, you just wanted me uh, to say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned DBS. Mm. Uh, I didn't have a question on DBS, but since but you no, brought it up, <laughs> um, that would also have been a possibility to mm. use DBS or mm. uh, the direct binary search mm. algorithm. So what's the main difference between DBS and this method that's been developed here? Um, I'm actually not fully familiar with how DBS works. I know it's, it takes into account the human visual system mm -hmm. and uh, it performs an iterative search, uh, but I don't have access to the codes and I haven't been, it's Jan Alebach's algorithm. Yes. Uh, so I haven't really, uh, so I haven't really no. known the details. It's okay to say that I haven't read the details because DBS is, what to say, a more complex method than yeah. some of the others. And I know uh, it works very well. I've seen the yeah. results. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's many people who have used DBS. Mm. Uh, but th th this is um, uh, being able to have full control of the algorithm and also being able to have access to the person who actually developed the algorithm mm. is of tremendous mm. uh, help. Mm, of course. Compared to choosing an algorithm that is outside and being made by, by someone else. Mm. Um, there is also a statement that you said about because the, the, this um, IMCDP has a filter. Mm -hmm. It's a low pass Gaussian filter with a standard deviation of 1.3, truncated to 11 by 11 pixels. And this shows the best choice. Mm. What I couldn't really find is whether this is something that is shown by others or if it's a contribution that you have made saying that this is actually the best optimal parameters. It's not b done by me. So the MCDP algorithm was a PhD thesis of Sassons. Uh, and I think in that paragraph I say, I refer to it several times and maybe not in this particular mm, sentence. No. And also this algorithm separates into regions. Mm. Um, and it wasn't described in your thesis as far as I could see this separation into the regions, at least not in section three. <laughs> mm. Mm. So could you just tell a little bit exactly how this separation into the regions is being done? Yeah, exactly. So I actually have a slide on that, a couple of slides. So the multi-level half-toning algorithm operates in several steps. And in order to display what it does, I show it here on a ramp, yeah. going from zeros to one. So uh, here we assume that we have three inks and therefore two different regions, or, or three different regions but and two thresholds that separate those. And for the state of the argument, we say that they are at one-third and two-thirds. Um, then we go into the actual algorithm. So these are all inputs into the algorithm. In the first pre-processing step, so what it does that it um, normalizes each, each region to values between zero and one in order to be able to binarize each region. Then it performs a half-toning, bi-level half-toning, and for this we use the IMCDP. Um, so then what we end up is with zeros and ones uh, all over the image. But then we know in the image 
which regions uh, correspond, uh, which uh, bit um, the zeros and ones, where are, there, uh, where are they in each region? So we substitute the zeros and ones by the values around the threshold. So, to be specific, the f in the first region, 0 and 1, we map that to 0 and 0, 0.33, and so on. Um, now, uh, from there, we take um, each of these values that should be printed. So 0 is paper, nothing. 0, 0.33, will um, correspond to uh, the lightest ink here. 0, 066 would be the next one, and 1 would be the darkest. Yep. And uh, that's how we make sure that there is no ink overlap, because here we part from zeros and ones. Uh, so by mapping this, then we get these results. Um, and then just in, Mat uh, in MATLAB, I write the function which extracts all these uh, multi-level values into bitmaps. So if we keep this mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, um, we can go into, you mentioned smoothness mm. in, in your presentation and discrepancies. Mm. And one of the areas that, or where you most likely would have problems is just at the threshold. You would think so, yes. 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 Um, and you might be able to see contouring because you have mm. to switch between one ink to the next ink. Yeah. Did you also consider to measure smoothness or measure contouring? Uh, w what we saw was, and here I need to go to the thesis for that. Um, we saw that... Because there does exist quite many different methods to measure smoothness or to measure contouring. Yeah. Uh, and some of it has been applied to printing, some of True. it has been applied to other displays, for example. True. And uh, it could have been done. What I did here in order to verify this by measuring it was just to plot the nominal versus the effective area coverage and see that around these thresholds there were no oscillations. Yeah, I remember the figure, it's, it's almost linear, it's almost perfect. Yeah, mm. uh, so by having a linear response, by being able to control the output, mm. we verify that there will no, be no discrepancies yeah. between, and then we printed quite a lot, so we saw that there was never a problem there, because the um, this would be due because the... Um, the color difference between those inks at these points are very similar also. So this helps a lot in order to uh, to make the transition smooth. Because, or, uh, I guess I have this question later, but I'll take it now. Because you say you printed a lot and you did verify um, and that it was actually correct or that it looked mm -hmm. good. This is also some of the questions I had in terms you have been printing a lot and you've been measuring a lot. So did you actually verify that all the prints were done, were looking okay? Or mm -hmm. was it just kind of printing, 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 <laughs> measuring without actually checking? Because there is a lot of things that could p potentially influence mm. when you do a printing. You can have banding or streaking or ink runs out or yep. clogged nozzles and things like this mm. that might influence the results. Mm. How did you... Well, I, I did take a look at the results, but it wasn't just me. Uh, my supervisors also kind of helped a lot mm. here uh, because we had a, a lot of open table discussions about the results and what do they mean. So if I thought something looked okay and they didn't or vice versa, then we would look at into it more. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a good strategy. Okay. <laughs> to, uh, to have someone to look at. Yeah. Subjective assessment. Mm. Um, I knew it. <laughs> you knew that this question was oh, coming. Yes. Um, so you state, uh, page 49, contrary to subjective visual assessment, the image quality do not fully correlate with the perception of overall qu print quality. Mm. I think in the same sentence, you cite my mm. thesis or my, my work. Yeah. And... Despite this being stated, you do not carry out subjective mm. relations and you rely only on 
objective evaluation. Mm -hmm. So why with this statement would you not do subjective assessment? Well, there are two answers to that. Uh, first, I say here that uh, objective quality metrics do not fully correlate. But then I do a lot of investig or I, I read a lot into what constitutes an objective measurement and how can we uh, corroborate what I'm doing uh, with actual research. Uh, so my feeling was that I got a good merge between uh, the results and the measurements. But I didn't do uh, subjective uh, testing, moreover, because of time, actually. I would have liked to do that uh, if I had more time. Uh, but for now, the color model we didn't print, or we, we could have. It just wasn't enough time. Oh, it's subjective assessment takes a lot of time, it's a lot of planning and being able to and do it. And it's an area of research that I haven't, like, really... I just took a couple of courses, one by you. Yeah. Uh, so it would have been needed some time to, for me to enter it. But of course, y you... Or the statement that you have with the reference refers to overall print quality. Mm which of course is different from what you're looking at because you're mm. looking at specific attributes. Mm. So you very nicely in your thesis are able to avoid this. I put the question there by intention yeah. To, yeah. to get it, but yeah. of course yeah, okay. you look at quality attributes True. and it has been shown that metrics correlate better with these quality attributes mm. and you decided to look at graininess and color accuracy. Mm. Mm. Um, and of course we, you said it, through the, the process that you were, you decided to look at graininess, so it's okay that you decided to look at that, and I think that's a, it's a nice attribute to look at. So we don't really need to discuss okay. too much on why you decided to, okay. to do this. Um, one thing that I was a little bit puzzled not to see was this, um, this is not taken from me, it's taken from Jan Alebach. Mm -hmm. um, these fundamental goals of half-toning and the discussion of these type of fundamental goals in the larger portion of the thesis because it's representation of tone and represent representation of details. Um, and to have this sharp, distinct, good contrast in rendering of fine structures in the image. I was expecting to see the, this, right. but I, I wasn't, I, I didn't see it uh, at least. Right. That was just a comment from, right. from my side. Yep. Um, Yes, this we already discussed, the switch that you have between the inks where you mm -hmm. would have um, have contouring or smoothness problems. Mm. Um, we already did that. Yes. Um, so, to use the standard deviation or the grain net index, you're required to have a patch, mm. right? Mm. So do you have any thoughts on measuring this of complex images? Because the graininess index that you have been using wouldn't work for a natural image. No. Because it requires this one number of the overall color exactly. of the patch. Yeah. So you wouldn't even be able to use it on a ramp. No. I could do different things. Um, I could first switch, I could compare the original image to the print and then do a comparison uh, where I would have a plot of the, um, of the differences. So if I pass the scanned image through C-Lab and then apply the color difference metric, um, Ideally, it would also show the results that the graininess has. Another thing I could do is look at uh, noise, uh, and then there are different ways to do that, but those are like not sp specific always about graininess. Uh, so this would be yeah, yeah. something different. I, th I think that's a good good answer as well. Of course, you could look at noise, but it is influenced by yeah. other properties yeah, as so well, exactly. and not only the, the graininess. Yeah. Um, there is also a statement on graininess and contrast. 
Um, they differentiated mainly by the lower contrast against the paper, thus reducing graininess. Mm -hmm. So, but if you lower contrast against the paper, what other issues or consequences would this have on the quality? There is a very specific, uh, I would like to thank a lot for actually sending the prints to me. Okay. Not only getting this and looking at, I do appreciate that you took the time to print and to send me the samples. Mm. Uh, because one of the things I, I noticed is when you put the, the light ink close to uh, an edge that mm. is a sharp edge, what you're doing, what it used to be was, for example, black ink to white paper. It has a higher contrast. So when you start putting lighting next to it, you get the the steepness of the edge yeah. is smaller. Yeah. So you yeah. get a loss of the contrast, and this loss of contrast reduce could mean that you actually have a loss of sharpness, so it doesn't look as sharp and crisp. Mm. 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 So by lowering the contrast in some cases would actually mean that you have a lower sharpness of mm. the image or perceived sharpness. Mm. It might mm. still have a very sharp edge but that you would actually perceive it as being... Yeah, um, that would definitely... Uh, so I would have liked to see discussion on okay. those aspects. Right. But of course, you focus on graininess and color accuracy, so mm -hmm. it's okay when you limit within that. Yeah, uh, but, but I, I think this is an important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then again, if you're, you're ideally only using um, the lightings ideally only were needed, so where the half tones would be very scarce. So there you wouldn't get a very crisp image either, but this would need to be <laughs> verified and everything. Yeah, there are certain areas, if you look mm. closely on the prints that you made, where yeah. you can see this. Okay. But of course, yeah. overall, if someone else would notice, of course, experts who are used to looking at this day in and day out, they will notice. Mm. Mm. But if you were asking someone else, they might, uh, oh, these images are the same. Mm. When you get to this just noticeable difference right. and these aspects, right. which, which I also think is very interesting and have comments on those as, yeah. those as well. Um, there are things like when you have printed, did you do one print or multiple prints and things? We talked about quality checking of patches. Mm -hmm. um, the scanning workflow, because you have scanned. Mm. Um, and a specific question that I had here is, you created the profile for the scanner using mm. the color checker. Yeah. And what was the reason for using the color checker and not the set of printed patches that you got from the printer? Because that what I normally would have yes, assumed. Yes, I understand. I um, actually I went with the default. I kind of thought that characterizing the printer. So my my notion with this was that I need to match what the printer sees to what I get on the RGB because uh, that RGB is what I need to transfer to LAB and to do the spatial filtering. So this was my line of thought. Okay, connect the scanner to uh, the LAB values. So this is why I use the color checker. Now I think I would have done with the printed patches. Because then the question is, okay, what's the consequences of actually using the color checker? Yeah, because they're not printed on the same paper yeah. with the same inks. Uh, so it's it's actually different. Uh, in order to match the RGB to uh, LAB, we did a series of uh, polynomial uh, um, lower the difference. Uh, so hopefully this uh, lowers any error that this might have induced. Or I can say that I, I used it, yeah. or I've done the same workflow and yeah. in my thesis as well, and I started yeah. using the color checker, and I went from the color checker to the printed right. patches. So right. I did the same thing, yeah. Yeah. that thinking yeah. that okay, it should be. Yeah. Um, I think I'll I'll skip that one. Um, this is just a comment. Mm -hmm. The evaluation of the grainness metrics show that they perform more or less similarly, and that's not so strange because they're all based on SC lab. So yeah. you would assume that since they're based on the same, that they would. Right. Um, 
There's also a question why you decided to use black, blue, and yellow for that analysis and not mm. the other inks. Mm. Uh, it could have been done with more, and uh, I did with several others also. Okay. But uh, so that these was my were next question. the more characteristics. Yeah. 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 I didn't look at all of them, but uh, cyan and magenta, for instance, and uh, red also. So we, we talked a little bit about viewing distance, and this is also important. Uh, um, I don't think I need this question. The distance of 25 mm -hmm. centimeters was selected as the viewing distance in the further studies. So why did you select 25? What's special about 25? Um, well, this would be... Uh, a distance on which I would usually uh, see the uh, the results. Also, in literature, sometimes they refer to 40 as the normal viewing distance. But other than my personal opinion, uh, when we add the lightings, then the perceived greenness decreases quite a lot. And in order to really uh, implement those inks and really make sure that the greenness is lower, then we can afford to look at it from closer. And then my, my next question is, did you actually consider the normal distances which we are actually able to focus? So this would be 40? No, it's not 40. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's closer than 25. Okay. Uh, so. um, I, I assume, no. <laughs> based on your question, that though you did consider right. that. But of course, this if it's too close, yeah. you, we are not able to focus. And if no. we are not able to focus, we cannot see sharp. And if we cannot see sharp, we cannot see the grain. So it is 25. I don't have a problem with 25. It was just why it was 25 right. and not right. Uh, right. another number. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was something that w we saw somewhere in literature also. And we were discussing which we mm. viewing distance. Uh, and yeah, it seemed much better than 40 for these reasons. Yeah. You also mentioned minor oscillation mm. scenes in yeah, the plot the due to avoidable patch and or scanning glass impurities. Yeah. So what could you have could you have done in order to avoid or reduce those oscillations that you see in the plots? Because you do comment on it in yeah. the thesis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I have actually considered doing something, but at the end I didn't have time. So what I could have done was just uh, to uh, write a code that selects all the impurities, and as soon as it sees that the standard deviation is too high, so calculate based on standard deviation and the mean, and then uh, and z-scores, and then when a particular pixel uh, deviates very much above or below, that then exclude it from the uh, the result. Of course, for the scanner, you could have scanned multiple times at different locations, mm. uh, but of course, that's also extra work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you needed to scan everything five yeah, times. Yeah, uh, but uh, I I had I, that was actually not so uh, such a big problem because I had uh, for the fifteen thousand patches, I had like ten sheets of. A4, which is scanned, and then mm. my algorithm just extracted each of the squares and performed the calculation. So this was actually not too much work. I also had a comment. I guess we talked about the natural images, uh, that the decrease in graininess when employing mm. multi-level indicates an increase in image quality. My question is, is it always true that uh, it would? Uh, because of the sharpness, you mean, and the crisp? Uh, yeah, I guess so, but I would need to do actual tests and measurements in order to, to see that. But I see the point where it's not always 100% going to be like that. Next question I had was the other attributes that's been influenced, we, we covered that. Mm. Um, I don't need to do that. So you inconsistencies between ink. You also sp you spend time on discussing this in the thesis, and you use delta E ninety four. Um, my question is: Did you also look at the delta C and the delta H? Because you report the overall, which is lightness, chroma, and mm. U, mm. but mm. you don't mm. discuss specifically individually, individually chroma mm. and U. No. Um, 
with you're talking about here in school, no, I haven't. Uh, and I think you're probably right. Uh, but I just did the delta E. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because that could be lightness changes, or it could yeah, be exactly, chroma or exactly. U, so yeah. separating those and looking into uh, yeah. into those. And these ink thresholds, which is based on on the color difference. Um, page 98, you found 40 and 65. And previously in section 532, you find 42 and a half and 62 and a half. Mm. So what's the visual impact of using one compared to the other? So if you change this a couple of percent. Mm. Um, so uh, first, are you sure or am I sure that I meant on page 98 for this type of paper? Or that's based on the... The um, RMS, maybe. Thresholds were found 1465 for the coated paper. With the... Uh, with the color difference okay. of... Okay, okay. And then I think... Uh, but this is with the color difference, not with the... So I did two, th or I did several things. I found the thresholds for the black ink, but not based on the color difference, but instead based on the CIY values. Yes. And these are the thresholds that you see there, 42 and a half and 62 and a half. And then on page 98, which you referred to, these are uh, found yes. based on the color difference. But then the question is, if you change the threshold from 40 to mm -hmm. 42, mm -hmm. what is actually the impact of that right. change of 2%? It, it probably wouldn't be yeah. a difference. Uh, I did several tests because uh, all four years of research. And uh, I changed paper, I changed the inks. So each time I have found the threshold again, and it was around these uh, values, uh, but a couple of percentages, I don't think it would have mattered. Um, there is also in mm -hmm. page 110, when you talk about the number of patches that yeah. you have, and you, all, you comment mm -hmm. that this is low, uh, yeah. which is also fine, and they're selected randomly, uh, did you look at the dis when you select this randomly the distribution that they actually have in the gamut? Mm -hmm. Because even if it's random, right. you might actually miss right. specific parts of the gamut. True, true. Uh, I just did it randomly without looking at the distribution. Uh, but then I thought it was still okay because in the later in the next chapter I I do the verification mm. for quite many more number of patches and the um, the mean is. Uh, fairly similar. Yeah. And also, are there some colors that's more um, problematic? Yeah, yellow, because of the um, dot gain, uh, the N factor. So the N factor for uh, the other inks is higher than N. So when you include, I include the mean of the N factors. Mm. So it's closer to something that the other inks have instead of yellow. So including yellow makes more difference. And also in your presentation today, you talked about the delta E of one. Mm. Why one? Uh, it's not written in stone. I don't like the equivalent there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's usually said that the delta E 76, uh, for that uh, delta E, uh, the just noticeable dis difference is around one. Uh, for uh, 94, which concurs more with what we actually see, uh, I haven't been able to find a definition of a just noticeable distance. Uh, but many times in literature, I have seen people referring to one and using one as the difference. So that's also why I used it. Yeah, and you also state in, in the same chapter, I believe, that, okay, this is user-defined, or you mm. it could be user-defined. Yeah, so. exactly. I also mm. shield myself with that sentence. Yes. <laughs> it's always good to have those type yeah. of sentences. Um, for the in-combinations, um, there is oscillations in the mm. graininess mm. when you look at it. And there is especially one place in 7.4 where there is an increase between in combination 15 and 60, um, where it kind of goes up again. Okay. And it seems like it is I some significant. I think I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. 
or I have it here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But of course, this might just be the order in how you actually shown the combinations, because uh, or they have almost the same. Yeah, it's uh, shown in increasing ink coverages. Yeah. So, is there a specific reason why that combination actually is worse than the um, others, can or is it just ran? Or um, it just seems strange to have it's quite smooth el yeah. elsewhere, and especially there, it peaks. Yeah. Um, um. Good. Uh, it might be due when I see the total amount of ink coverage. Uh, so maybe <laughs> we're approaching the area where uh, it does it still have blue? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Why. No. No. And I don't expect you to. No, know all the things I would need to take a look at the results. Maybe and that was also a specific ink combination that had a, a standard deviation more. Than yeah. yeah. And also in 7.5, there are larger oscillations at the end of the ink combinations mm -hmm. compared to earlier. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure why this actually ends up at the end there that it oscillates more than, than previously. Yeah, uh, when it's actually when it's uh, close to full tone coverage or full tone coverage, especially if sometimes the inks are very dark, then uh, sometimes mottling occurs, and mm -hmm. th that that uh, influences, yes, of yeah, course. Yeah, so and that I might can't be the reason. always differentiate it. Yeah, that was actually a very good answer. Yeah, <laughs> are you surprised? <laughs> um, you also talk about the, the graininess thresholds. Yeah. Uh, so what would be unacceptable? You, you said a number in mm -hmm. the presentation today, stating mm -hmm. that this was kind of okay where right. it's visible. Right. So mm. how would you verify and what approach would you take to actually find that threshold? So I picked 0 0.5 because um, that was approximately the graininess index of full tone black ink. But because of mottling, it might be even mm. lower. But um, I would need to do subjective testing in order to uh, to verify this. So I wouldn't write at its tone at yeah. all uh, that the just noticeable GI was this value without subjective testing. Which is more or less, y you're now <laughs> going into my next question. OK, so good. Um, um, and of course, as you say, you would need observers, you would need mm -hmm. to do studies to find this just noticeable difference because, and it might also depend from person to person, mm -hmm. so that, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to talk about was also this GI metric because mm -hmm. you said it does pooling, so you get one number. Um, would it be usable, useful to have a graininess map, like for the ramps? Not for a patch because that would be, but for the ramps. I have done a couple of grainness maps, uh, but on images, uh, and just compared the result, how it is without filtering, uh, not in the thesis. No. Um, maybe. Um, or I can say what I think. I, yeah. I think that in some cases, where you have these transitions and things happening, a map would be useful to detect exactly where you would have a problem. Right. Uh, in a patch, of course, it's uniform, but when you have these, and one number might not be able to pick up that you have one line or one specific yeah. small area because you average over a larger, a, a larger image. Mm -hmm. So that's where mm -hmm. I think you would kind of mm -hmm. a map would be useful. Right. And you could then use this map threshold the map to find out oh that's the specific area and you could do post processing on that area. Yeah. For example. Yeah. True. Um, mm. uh, looking to see if I had more specific questions. Uh, I think there is a lot, you, in the beginning you mentioned visual human system, pleasant and visual quality, improving visual quality. Mm. I think there is a lot to do in the direction of the being able to measure this visually mm. in images to improve the quality. Mm. But that's not part of, of your work. Mm. Um, I am getting towards the end of my, uh, my questions now. So the goal of your work was uh, developing and adapting color separation models and half-toning algorithms that increase the perceived image quality multi-channel. 
printing. So have you been able to reach this? Without trying to sound absolutistic, I would say yes. Um, but there is still a lot that can be done. Uh, so I wouldn't say that I have reached the end of that. But I would say that I have been able to go towards that at a good pace, maybe. If you said no, we probably wouldn't be here. No. <laughs> <laughs> or we could have been here and you could have an excellent thesis to say, though it's not possible to reach this, but uh, I, yeah. I think you're... Yeah. You know. um, I will end with the last question. Mm -hmm. um, and are you proud of the work that you have carried out? I am. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, you for you that last question. You should be proud of the work that <laughs> you have been doing. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering, for leaving that for last. It's a nice and yeah, I'm very proud. Um, I have had enormous help, obviously, but I'm very proud with uh, well the published work and the published articles and the thesis. It it's written black and white. Uh, everything that I've been working on and the specific contributions I think you should be proud I think you when you look at this and you take it up in a year or two or ten you look at this and you still feel that oh I'm proud of the work that I did <laughs> uh, and uh, this is how it should be mm. I think that you should be proud thank you so much so that concludes my my questions thank you <laughs> <laughs>